24 standard causes of, of human misjudgment. First, under recognition of the power of what psychologists call reinforcement and, economic, and economists call incentives. Early in the history of Xerox, Joe Wilson, who was then in the government, had to go back to Xerox because he couldn't understand how their better new machine was selling so poorly in relation to their older and inferior machine. Of course, when he got there, he found out that the commission arrangement with the salesman gave a tremendous incentive to the inferior machine. My second factor is simple psychological denial. This first really hit me between the eyes when a friend of our family had a super athlete, super student son who flew off a carrier in the North Atlantic and never came back. And his mother, who had, was a very sane woman, just never believed it. he was dead. Simple psychological denial. The reality is too, too painful to bear, so you just distort it until it's bearable. We all do that to some extent. Third, incentive caused bias. Here, my early experience was a doctor who sent bushel baskets full of normal gallbladders down to the pathology lab in a leading hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska. He thought that the gallbladder was the source of all medical evil, and that if you really loved your patients, you couldn't get that organ out rapidly enough. Uh, now, that's an extreme case, but in lesser strength, it's present in every profession and in every human being. If you take sales presentations of brokers of commercial real estate and business businesses, I'm 70 years old. I've never seen one I thought was even within hailing distance of objective truth. Fourth, bias from consistency and commitment tendency. But what I'm saying here is that the human mind is a lot like the human egg. And the human egg has a shutoff device. When one sperm gets in, it shuts down so the next one can't get in. The human mind has a big tendency of the same sort. And here again, it doesn't just catch ordinary mortals, it catches the deans of physics. According to Max Planck, the really innovative, important new physics was never really accepted by the old guard. Instead, a new guard came along that was less brain blocked by its previous conclusions. Wherever you turn, this consistency and commitment tendency is, is affecting you. In other words, what you think may change what you do, but perhaps even more important, what you do will change what you think. And of course, if you make a public disclosure of your conclusion, you're pounding it in to your own head. It's very important to not put your brain in chains too young by what you shout out. Uh, sixth, bias from Pavlovian association, misconstruing past correlation as a re reliable basis for decision making. But I did learn about Pavlov in high school biology. You know, so the dog salivated when the bell rang. So what? Well, the truth of the matter is that Pavlovian association is an enormously powerful psychological force in the daily life of all of us. Practically, well, I'd say three quarters of advertising works on pure Pavlov. Take Coca-Cola Company. They want to be associated with every wonderful image, heroics in the Olympics, wonderful music, you name it. They don't want to be associated with presidents, funerals, and so forth. When have you seen a Coca-Cola ad associated with bad psychologically rooted tendencies? And the, the association really works. And all these psychological tendencies work largely or entirely at a, on a subconscious level, which, is, which makes them very insidious. Talking about economics, you've got two products. Suppose they're complex technical products. Now, you'd think under the laws of economics that if product A costs X, if product Y costs X minus something, it will sell better than if it sells at X plus something. But that's not so. In many cases, when you raise the price of the alternative product, it'll get a larger market share than it would when you make it lower than your competitor's product. It's a pure Pavlovian phenomenon. Seventh, bias from reciprocation tendency, including the tendency of one in a role to act as other persons expect. Cialdini demonstrated this by running around a campus and he asked people to, to take juvenile delinquents to the zoo. And it was a campus and so one in six actually agreed to do it. 
And, uh, <laughs> and after he'd accumulated the statistical output, he went around on the same campus and he asked other people, he said, Jay, would you devote two afternoons a week to taking juvenile delinquents somewhere and suffering greatly yourself to help them? And there he got 100% of the people to say no. But after he'd made the first request, he backed off a little. And he said, well, would you at least take them to the zoo one afternoon? He raised the compliance rate from a third to a half. He got three times the success by just going through the little ask for a lot and back off. Now, if the human mind on a subconscious level can be manipulated that way, and you don't know it, well, I always use the phrase, you're like a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. Eight, bias from over-influence by social proof that is, the conclusions of others. And here, one of the cases the psychologist uses, Kitty Genovese, where all these people, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 of them, just sort of sat and did nothing while she was slowly murdered. Yeah. Now, one of the explanations is that everybody looked at everybody else and nobody else was doing anything, and so there's automatic social proof that the right thing to do is nothing. That's only part of it. Big shot businessmen get into these waves of social proof. Do you remember some years ago when one oil company bought a fertilizer company? And every other major oil company practically ran out and bought a fertilizer company. And there was no more damn reason for all these oil companies to buy fertilizer companies. But they didn't know exactly what to do. And if Exxon was doing it, it was good enough for mobile or vice versa. It was a total disaster. Nine, bias from contrast caused distortions of sensation, perception, and cognition. Here, the great experiment that Cialdini does in his class is he takes three buckets of water. One's hot, one's cold, and one's room temperature. And he has the students stick his left hand in the hot water and his right hand in the cold water. Then he has them remove the hands and put them both in the room temperature bucket. And of course, with both hands in the same bucket of water, one seems hot and the other seems cold because the sensation apparatus of man is over-influenced by contrast. It has no absolute scale. It takes a certain percentage change before it's noticed. Maybe you've had a magician remove your watch. I certainly have without your noticing it. It's the same thing. Cialdini cites the case of the real estate broker, and you've got the rube that's been transferred into your town, and the first thing you do is you take the rube out to the two of the most awful overpriced houses you've ever seen, and then you take the rube to some moderately overpriced house, and then you stick them. And it, it works pretty well, which is why the real estate salesmen do it. Bias from over-influence by authority. You got a pilot and a co-pilot. The pilot is the authority figure. They don't do this in airplanes, but they've done it in simulators. They have the pilot to do something where an idiot co-pilot would know the plane was going to crash. But the pilot's doing it, and the co-pilot is sitting there, and the pilot is the authority figure. Twenty-five percent of the time, the plane crashes. Eleven, bias from deprival super-reaction syndrome, including bias caused by present or threatened scarcity, including threatened removal of something almost possessed but never possessed. Here I took the Munger dog, lovely, harmless dog. The one way, the only way to get that dog to bite you was to try and take something out of its mouth after it was already there. Human version of that dog is there in all of us. Bias from envy, jealousy. Here again, you go through the psychology survey courses. And you go to the index. Envy, jealousy. Thousand page book. It's blank. There's some blind spots in academia. But it's an enormously powerful uh, thing, and it operates to a considerable extent on a subconscious level. I've heard Warren say a half a dozen times, it's not greed that drives the world, but envy. Bias from chemical dependency. Well, we don't have to talk about that. We've all seen so much of it. But it's interesting how it always causes moral breakdown if there's any need. And, uh, and it always involves massive denial. Uh, bias from misgambling compulsion. For instance, a lottery. You have a lottery where you get your number by lot, and then somebody draws a number by lot. It gets lousy play. You get a lottery where get, people get to pick their number. 
hit big play. The minute they picked it themselves, it gets an extra validity. After all, they thought it and they acted on it. Miss gambling compulsion is a very, very powerful and important thing. Look at what's happening to our country and look at the people who were ruined by it. Bias from liking distortion, including the tendency to especially like oneself, one's own kind, and one's own idea structures, and the tendency to be especially susceptible to being misled by someone liked. Disliking distortion, bias from that. The reciprocal of liking distortion, and the tendency not to learn appropriately from someone disliked. Hugely powerful tendencies. To the man with a hammer, every problem tends to look pretty much like a nail. Why is man with the hammer syndrome? always present. His professional reputation is all tied up with what he knows. He likes himself and he likes his own ideas and, uh, and uh, he's expressed them to other people. George Bernard Shaw said and had a character say in The Doctor's Dilemma, in the last analysis every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. But he didn't have it quite right because it isn't so much conspiracy as it is a subconscious psychological tendency. The guy tells you what is good for him. He doesn't recognize that he's doing anything wrong any more than that doctor did when he was pulling out all those normal gallbladders. So you're getting your advice in this world from your paid advisor with this huge load of ghastly bias. There are only two ways to handle it. You can hire your advisor and then just apply a windage factor, like I used to do when I was a rifle shooter. I just didn't just for so many miles an hour of wind. And or you can learn the basic elements of your advisor's trade. You don't have to learn very much, by the way, because you learn just a little, and then you can make him explain why he's right. Bias from the non-mathematical nature of the human brain in its natural state, as it deals with probabilities employing crude heuristics, psychologists, Don Manike and Tversky, raise the idea of availability to a whole heuristic of misjudgment. They are very substantially right. I mean, ask the Coca-Cola company, which has raised availability to a secular religion, if availability changes behavior. You will drink a hell of a lot more Coke if it's always available. I mean, availability does change behavior and cognition. It isn't just the lack of availability that distorts your judgment. All the things on this list distort judgment. Here, I think we should discuss John Goodfriend. Goodfriend has a trusted employee, and it comes to light, not through confession, but by accident, that the trusted employee has lied like hell to the government and manipulated the accounting system, and it was really equivalent to forgery. And uh, the man immediately says, I've never done it before, I'll never do it again, it was an isolated example. And you know the guy's wife, and, and he's right in front of you, and there's human sympathy, and he's sort of asking for your help. And so there are a lot of psychological forces at work. And at any rate, good friend does not cashier the man. And of course, he had done it before, and he did do it again. And, and that simple decision destroyed John Goodfriend. We cashier them. It would be evil not to because terribly behavior spreads. It, now we come bias from over-influence by extra vivid evidence. I once bought 300 shares of a stock and the guy called me back and said, I've got 1,500 more. I have seen a lot of vivid peculiarities in a long life, but this guy set a world record. I'm talking about the CEO and I just misweighed it. The truth of the matter is his situation was foolproof. He was soon going to be dead. I turned down the extra 1,500 shares, and it's now cost me $30 million. And it wasn't something where stock was generally available. And uh, so it's very easy to misweigh the vivid evidence. Mental confusion caused by information not arrayed in the mind in theory structures creating sound generalizations developed in response to the question, why? Well, we all know people who flunk. And they try and memorize, and they try and spout back, and they just, it just doesn't work. The brain doesn't work that way. You've got to array facts on theory structures answering the question, why? If you don't do that, you just, you cannot handle the world. 
other normal limitations of sensation, memory, cognition, and knowledge. Uh, Stress-induced mental changes. Here my favorite example is, is, is the great Pavlov. And he had all these dogs in cages, which had all been conditioned into changed behaviors. And the great Leningrad flood came and the, just went right up and the dog's in a cage. And the dog was, had as much stress as you can imagine a dog ever having. And the water receded in time to save some of the dogs. And, and Pavlov noted that they'd had a total reversal of their conditioned personality. Then we've got other common mental illnesses and declines, temporary and permanent. And then I've got mental and organizational confusion from say something syndrome. And here my favorite thing is the bee, the honeybee. And the honeybee goes out and finds the nectar and he comes back, he does a dance that communicates to the other bees where the nectar is and they go out and get it. Well, some scientist decided to do an experiment. He put the nectar straight up, way up. Well, in a natural setting, there is no nectar way the hell straight up. And the poor honeybee doesn't have a genetic program that is adequate to handle what he now has to communicate. And you'd think the honeybee would come back to the hive and slink into a corner. But he doesn't. He comes into the hive and does this incoherent dance. And all my life I've been dealing with the human equivalent of that honeybee. Three, four, five of these things work together and it turns human brains into mush. And I use that pattern to help me get through life. The final question is, if the thought system indicated by this list of psychological tendencies has great value not widely recognized and employed, what should the educational system do about it? I am not going to answer that one now. I, I like leaving a little mystery.